first time we started preparing for the uh, pandemic um, wasn't till later. However, the notification that there was something going on in Wuhan City, China, um, started with correspondence we received about December 2019. And that was when we got some information trying to alert us of an ongoing respiratory infection that was going on in Wuhan in China. And at that point, there was suspicion that it was a viral pathogen. And so we get regular updates from the regional microbiologists um, and also uh, from PHE, which is uh, Public Health England. Um, and I had to circulate it to all clinicians and then lead managers in the trust to allow them that there is a pneumonia of unknown etiology uh, that was circulating in Wuhan. And then by, by the second, third week of January 2020, it was identified that, that it was a coronavirus. Um, after the um, briefing note from Public Health England, um, this was forwarded to all clinicians and uh, lead managers in the trust. Uh, we also um, showed how we can try to prepare ourselves by using the right personal protective equipment, which is tag PPE among healthcare workers, and then um, also which involve you know uh, feed testing for the FFP3 and um, and also gowns and uh, gloves and uh, eye protection. Um, and also to advise that the suspected patient should wear a surgical mask. Um, so it went on um, up to later part in January and we started developing our own local protocol to try to match what um, PHE uh, gave because again we have to make it generic. So multiple meetings were set up, groups and a lot of things started developing um, one of the key issues again was the uh, massive um, turnout of guidelines from Public Health England on a daily basis and we had to try and adapt all these to try to help us um, you know, adjust. And there were a lot of modifications that came through then. Um, I remember back in early February and there was also guidance on setting up the um, coronavirus pod and we started looking for uh, what would be an ideal pod we are, are we going to uh, uh, locate this pod and this was to help us see if we can pick up as many cases in the community as possible without bringing them into hospital so that once they are positive then we can easily transport them to a um, highly infectious disease uh, airborne facility um, just to keep them away from the main hospital but that didn't seem to have worked because the number of cases that kept coming up positive later um, became so enormous that uh, there was a cessation of that project and the next thing is that we need to start looking at you know uh, admitting this patient within our own hospital and managing them as such. At the early onset we also set up um, a category 4 box in the trust now, one of the challenges we had was because we are multi-site, uh, we had to make sure that in each site there is some um, facilities available to be able to cope with this, especially when someone with a suspected case just um, presents at our doorstep. Um, so we had to make sure that we had this Category 4 box, which had v virtually all the contingencies you need to be able to um, prepare staff. Um, the appropriate PPE they required and also um, for the care of the patient. Um, and this we are located in our in emergency department at both Doncaster and Pasadlo and also at uh, medical assessment unit um, and ATC at Pasadlo and both ITUs. One of the key things that actually came up from this was the uh, guidelines. Uh, because they kept changing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I remember the very first um, guideline um, published by Public Health England was on the 24th of January, uh, which I circulated to all lead clinicians and managers in the trust. Following that, we developed our very first uh, DBTH uh, flowchart for uh, the suspected case of the uh, Wuhan novel coronavirus which I released to the trust on the 31st of January. And then the second version 
followed up on the 10th of February. And I remember the third version of that particular guideline was released the next day on the 11th. And that had to do with the coronavirus pod. And then the fourth version was uh, on the 14th, which was two days later. The eighth version was on the 13th of uh, March. And at that point, we had a case definition change. And the ninth version was on the 19th. And the tenth version of that was on the 18th of March, uh, which had to do with um, individual trusts having to manage this patient locally because initially it was meant that we had to transfer any confirmed case to in fact it was um, Newcastle and then it came to um, Sheffield but then they said no you have to manage this patient in your own hospital and I can say that as of the 28th of January this year we won the 30th version of that particular guideline. That is just one document with multiple <laughs> versions over the years and, and that was kind of very challenging for me because by the time I sit down to try to look at all the new guidelines from Public Health England and then I have to look at our own guidelines to make it, um, you know, adapt it in a way that it will be suitable for the trust and will meet our own purpose. Um, by the time you even design it and bring it out, you find out that, oh, you might need to change it again. I, I must say thanks to Adam Tingo because he was, he was the first person I always send this to and make sure you know, he updates this. And I think that's one of the key success for us in terms of the communication, making sure that people are aware what is happening at every stage um, of the uh, pandemic. The key things we wanted to make sure was that we didn't um, leave an old document behind, you know, where people still sit and confuse it with what is the most current change or update, uh, especially around the PPE, because we felt we needed it to try to protect our staff from acquiring um, the um, coronavirus infection and also keeping our patients safe. The other challenge, I would say, um, we had was around testing. Because when we started, and this is going back to um, January, initially it was, uh, we had to send all the samples to Colindale, and it involved sending both um, sputum, you know, sending blood samples, sending urine samples, sending stool samples. So we had to collect all these and forwarded them to Colindale. So you can imagine the enormous uh, impact it had then. But I think when we started making a great progress was when we had the ability to test locally or in-house. And that gave us the opportunity because the turnaround time for diagnosis of any um, suspected case was down to under a day. And you can see the changes it made compared to, you know, waiting for results for up to three days previously. And um, even now, it's even more better because with the point of care test, you can know if a patient is um, positive or negative under 20 minutes, which is beautiful. So I wish we had all these facilities then, because that would have probably helped to prevent a lot of transmission of cases to older vulnerable patients. The other issue was around management of patients, because there was a bit of unclarity, um, because a lot of hospitals were felt not to be probably appropriate to handle such cases. Uh, and we weren't sure the numbers we were going to get. So all the attention then was, if you do have a confirmed case, send it to uh, an airborne um, uh, facility uh, where they manage such cases. And to us, the nearest was Newcastle. But again, Newcastle wasn't going to be able to cope with the onsite and then to the next infectious disease center, which for us was Sheffield Teaching Hospital. And then it got to a point where we, I remember when we had our first patient in March, and then we had to keep the patient locally because uh, you manage your own patient. So these weren't in the initial contingency plan to manage patients who are positive. And if we had that um, from the very onset, that would have probably given us a different way of, you know, how do we go about, you know, reconfiguring certain aspects of our world towards that. Uh, but again, we did that and we've managed uh, thousands of patients in the trust since then 
and many of whom have been discharged home successfully, uh, which is very good. One of the other challenges I would say we um, face as a trust is the multiple sites um, uh, we operate, which includes Doncaster, Bassett Law, uh, Mexboro, and um, Rectford to some extent. Um, and then the fact that these are mainly old buildings which were not designed to cope with the kind of sudden change you want. One of the things that actually we learned from last year, which is um, on the positive side, is the availability of uh, point of care tests and also allowing laboratories in hospitals to be able to have facilities to do an in-house testing. And that also helps for rapid diagnosis of cases rather than waiting days. I mean, even when we sent our samples to Sheffield, at times it takes about three days to have results. And you can imagine what could have happened between when you send a sample and that three days. There's a lot of um, unknowns and a lot of possible spread of infection in those setting. Um, so that may have also, um, that, that was very helpful, I would say. And if you look at the successes that have been done now, uh, for example, we have lateral flow test. And this again is something that has been developed because of, you know, trying to control the pandemic. And that has also helped us to test themselves at home. And that has massively, you know, improved, you know, the exposure of people who are incubating or, you know, positive or asymptomatic carriers from infecting their colleagues and also all the patients. So that's a very big positive, I would say. And then, of course, the uh, availability of vaccination, uh, which is uh, the, the, the shortest we've uh, had a vaccine developed and made available um, in the world. And, and that, in itself, we can see the impact of the vaccination, which is also helping to reduce um, the spread of the infection. Teamwork has also prevailed and helped us to overcome the difficulties um, we had. Um, I would personally want to say a big thank you because I know uh, people say um, I've done most of this, you know, but it's not me, it's the teamwork, I must say. Um, the infection control team has been fantastic, especially Carol Scully and Mims Boyak. They have worked tirelessly um, and always been very supportive and I must say thank you to them. Um, the trust executive has, have also been very wonderful, um, led by Richard Parker and um, David Perdue. Um, Sewa was there before, before handing over to team. So uh, Becky Joyce and uh, Karen Bernard and uh, Kirsty Edmond Jones, just to mention a few, they've all been very supportive and very involved. And I, I, I I can't um, thank them enough for the support they've given to make uh, us um, get around this pandemic. Silver Team is another one that I must say a big thank you to because uh, we started the, I mean, back in January, we started the meetings in Becky Joyce's office, a meeting on <laughs> almost on a daily basis uh, with daily catch ups. And then we felt, oh, this has gotten beyond you know, just that regular meeting. And I think there was need to set up a bronze, a silver and um, a gold command. And so the silver command team, again, Jody uh, Roberts has been fantastic um, in leading that. Uh, Simon, uh, Kirsty uh, Clark, uh, Kate uh, and Tony, um, Richard Somerset, uh, the divisional directors, they've all been part of it and worked hard. Eki, um, Antonia, Nick and um, Jochen, they've all been all part of this and the deputy medical directors as well. And not to forget Adam Tingle, yes. And then pathology has been fantastic uh, as well because um, they've tried to meet up with the challenges. Uh, Paul Gravel as the head of service, uh, been supportive in that, um, in that sense. And then we have Mike who is the head BMSA Micro. He's been fantastic leading the patch from Micro and helping with the development of the PCR in-house, uh, you know, doing the um, um, validations uh, and also the antibody testing, which is another fantastic thing he helped to set up in-house. Um, so microbiology has been fantastic and helping to improve the turnaround time for the PCR testing and also have a fantastic chief uh, BMS in microbiology 
um, uh, Michelle Poole, she's been fantastic, also helping to make sure that the testing, the, uh, especially with the community testing, that they have all they need, the swaps, and it's been fantastic work from her. And we have Alison um, in um, pathology, um, also with the mortuary capacity and making sure that we're coping with that. And then we have Sarah in the biochemistry. Uh, these are the chiefs there and they've, uh, they had BMS, sorry, in um, um, both histopathology and biochemistry and they've been fantastic. And then the ED team have been fantastic also, Kai and, and team, uh, because they helped us to you know, monitor the constant changes that were coming through ED. Like I said, it's a, a wonderful time working with so many people in the trust um, to try to achieve the goal. Um, it's not been a very easy time because none of us have faced a pandemic of this man magnitude before. And I think it is um, a good thing to um, look back now and see, you know, that yes, um, we've all at least tried to reduce the worst case scenario um, that we would have been faced with in the trust.